Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Not So Common Podcast. My guest is one of the first, if not the first, guest I've had on the Not So Common Podcast, which was episode two or three. It's Mark Bustler from Classic Game Room. Uh, Mark, welcome back. It's been a while. I think that was like March or April of last year. Top 10 reasons Pat Country is awesome. You won't believe number three. (laughs) <laughs> well okay now i'm on the edge of my seat mark what's number three because you're one of my first guests <laughs> your new mic sounds great we were we were talking tech before we started recording you, you you're you're very very manly sounding today are you saying last time i was not is that what you're saying <laughs> I, I did not imply any such thing pat so how was your how was your 2017 what happened last year with you mark let's let's catch up well, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, so I'm a little tired. No, I don't think I did once. It's like that one episode of the X Files where the guy like never sleeps, and then he goes crazy. Uh, 2017 was was a wild year. It was pr- professionally the busiest year of my life. Um, and uh, I've a- actually, looking back on it, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Oh, we talked on March 11th. So yeah, it's been nearly. It's been a little, a uh, little more than 11 months. So it's been a while, um, and you have a lot going on. This, we're actually recording this on February 20th, which you told me before we started recording. But this is the 10th anniversary of the first reboot of your show, which is That's right. the HD Classic Game Room. So that's where you manned up in 2008, and, and we're one of, the, <laughs> one of the first to get an HD camera on, no, uh, actually, on YouTube. <laughs> It was before they, it was before YouTube did high definition. February twentieth, two thousand eight, which is ten years ago today. This is the ten year anniversary of Classic Game Room HD's debut on on YouTube, which at the time was this fledgling startup video company. And I posted the review of Zaxxon for Atari twenty six hundred, and uh, fans of the show know that one because it features Monotone Mark, who reviews Zaxxon for the Atari twenty. So it was before I think the style really had. Uh, I don't think. Know, de- yeah, it was kind of its own personality. Really, it was actually yeah, it was kind of pointless, Mark, because yeah, uh, YouTube didn't go and support HD till like what 2012 was it? So, I, I saw it coming. I figured because I'd actually <laughs> been working in the documentary industry for years prior to that, and I was working in high definition uh, doing uh, films, and I have I still have a whole bunch of stuff up on PBS and whatnot, and we'll get to that a bit later because that's actually probably a good segue into some of my new stuff, but. I figured they'd be going HD, so I just threw the HD on the title, partly in preparation, but also partly because I thought it was funny that I recorded it on a VCR, and I just said that HD stood for uh, heavy duty. Yeah, it makes sense. You didn't, I don't think you ever talked, spoke to me about your documentary background, so, so uh, or, or very little. Give me an example of some of the documentaries you worked on. Uh, the biggest... The biggest one is called Expo Magic of the White City, which uh, was released in 2005 on the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, narrated by Gene Wilder. So I got to work with Gene Wilder on that, which was awesome. Wow, he doesn't work that much anymore. So that's a rare treat. Well, he, well, he's 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 not alive anymore at this point. Well, unfortunately, I, okay, he died last year. I think it was last <laughs> but before year or two that, years ago. he wasn't really acting anything anymore. But <laughs> thanks for thanks for pointing out my faux pas. Yes, <laughs> <That's> all right. <laughs> I, I'll never forget. I was sitting there. Yeah, we, we secured him for uh, for this film, and it was awesome. I got to talk to him on the phone beforehand. And by the way, he was really nice. I'm not just saying that because we're, we're recording this. Like He actually was really nice. Uh, and it was just great sitting there in the studio and just in walks Gene Wilder. And it's like, holy, holy shit, man. It's just really wonky. I just walked in the room. This is incredible. And it was it was so he was so good. He was it, like just the way he responded to direction and his his own approach on reading lines and it was an interesting choice for that film, but one that actually got us a lot of publicity. We sold a lot of copies of that film. That was my most successful uh, documentary film to date. It got on PBS. And um, yeah, I've also produced a number of Civil War ones. And I did a film called, my last one was called Westinghouse, uh, which was on George Westinghouse. And that was 2008. My grandfather, my grandfather worked at Westinghouse for like 40 years. Yeah, a lot of people did back in the day. That was a big company. That was the, the big standard, right? It was GE and Westinghouse, and Westinghouse probably got bought out by someone at some point, right? Were they bought out by GE? I have no idea. Uh, they got all those companies all got broken up, and like I forget one. I think GE did take over like one part of the electric business. Westinghouse Air Brake still ends. I think Westinghouse Air Brake is still actually functioning. The rest of Westinghouse Nuclear, I think, is now owned by Toshiba. I learned I learned all this stuff years ago, so I probably have some of it wrong. 
And my grandfather used to say, I worked at Westinghouse for 43 years or 37 years. You know, one of those back then you had one job for life, right? You, you started, uh, you started yeah. in the, you started in the mail room and worked your way up, you know, to manager or middle management or whatever. But you know, era. he always loved it because he still got that check after he retired. He still had that pension check every yep. week it came or every two weeks. And so even after they were bought out, like they still had the pension as part of that. You know, that was part of the deal. Sort of the buy yeah, actually uh oh, sorry, go ahead. Also sort of the bygone era of of having pensions take care of you. You know. Yeah. That, that's not that, that's not there for us anymore unless you work for a union yeah. or you're a teacher maybe or work for the government. You you might have one, you know, or a police officer or something like that, or a fireman. But um but what Westinghouse actually Westinghouse is an interesting story because it was the last one that came out and at that time I think it came out in like April or May of 08 so by that time I'd already started working on Classic Game Room uh, but it really hadn't uh, grown grown to uh, much yet but it was growing quickly and then I saw the writing on the wall for the documentary business and actually moved over uh, into the into Classic Game Room which ended up being a full time gig for you know nearly ten years. Uh, so hi is history your, your original passion or, or, or a large passion then? Uh, no, actually my background is in art, uh, primarily art and writing. Um, I started out doing print work, which then evolved into website work in the mid nineties. I came out of school with a degree in marketing and I was self-taught website, uh, website designer. So I was doing websites and uh, designing advertisements and then that's actually what got me into the into the whole game room stuff is that the company at the time, we had this little production department called Inicom, which is still the company that I run today, uh, and we uh, we started pioneering this internet broadcasting stuff in 1999. It was uh, during the summer of '99 we were pioneering webcasting for engineering software, and uh, we were just goofing around and ended up actually. One thing led to another, started making entertainment shows, and I created a show called The Game Room, uh, and I was at film school at that time also, after school, and uh, Dave, Dave and I were in school together. We worked together for that first year, and then had to shut the show down after we couldn't get any internet fin any financing to run the internet business, and then I moved into documentary producing from there with the dawn of the DVD era, and this is like 18 years ago. <laughs> yeah, now we're at the end of the DVD era. Mostly. Oh, it's been long gone for a while, yeah. I mean, they still sell them, but now they're mostly... I mean, I think it's mostly the independents that make them. And now when they make a new movie, they just throw in the cheap... It costs like 10 cents to press a, yeah. a DVD. They throw it in with the Blu-ray just in case someone wants it. Someone, just in case someone's grandma still has a DVD player. <laughs> yeah. I mean, See, back in the day, my grandparents just had VHS, but now grandparents have DVD players. Uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> Blu-ray never really caught on the way it did because we're at the end of physical media when it comes yep. to... Uh, audio and video. I actually saw a graph that uh, Vsauce, I think Kevin Lieber, I'm friends with from Vsauce too, he retweeted like the rise and fall of CDs. I mean, the first year of CD sales was like 83 and, you know, it's very small. And then the peak was about 2000, 2001, something yeah. like that. And then you just see it just to fall. It's like a, uh, what type of graph is that? It goes like a bell curve almost goes up, then it comes back down. Um, oh, you've just described the classic game room graph. Classic game room growth, but not your views, or? <laughs> <laughs> That's the classic game room graph you just described, a bell curve. Now I know what to call it. You have, 400, you have 471,000 YouTube subscribers, by the way, which is insane. That's a lot. I, I mean, uh, Yeah, but I think my posts have only gone out to like 12,000 of them at any given time. YouTube has, I don't know what the hell they've done, man. They've just, it's like they had a giant, they've had a giant finger over the last couple of years and it just squashed me. With this like maniacal grin on their face, for some reason I'm I'm still unsure of. It's like I pissed them off in a former life. Do, did you? Is that what happened? You were you were coasting along. You send out a video, it get fifty thousand views or sixty thousand, and now oh, was it was like virtually overnight. You think it just the algorithm just killed all your videos, or maybe the genre in, in general? I think it's a combination of everything. Definitely the genre in general, but we can we can cover that in a bit. Uh, yeah, the peak for me was definitely, 08 was awesome, 2009. It's, it's actually funny looking back on this 10 years because there's been so many ups and downs. But I remember 2008 was like, just what, you know, I, I was ex coming out of the documentary business like, all right, I'm going to do video game reviews again. This is ridiculous. All right, whatever, you know. And then people started listening or people started watching the shows and I was actually having fun. I mean, I, I collected Atari and Sega Genesis uh, you know, pretty passionately back then. I still do. Uh, and then I just started, you know, segueing into like 360 and I ended up picking up a Sega Saturn. That's always a big fan favorite videos. The Mark buys a Sega Saturn and 
Uh, one thing led to another from that. 2009 got actually really big. And 10, 11, 12 was growth. We were expanding. And in 13, they just stomped on me. <laughs> so it was 2013. That was, you can say, the line delineation where the growth slowed and the number of views per video just sort of went down from there. Uh, all of, Definitely early 13, there was a huge drop in viewership. I think they made a big algorithm change in there. So a lot of the stuff that had been doing very well for me suddenly was not doing very well for me. So I have many, many videos up in the multi-millions. But that's all from like that era. Okay. And then mid-2013, late 2013, I remember this pretty well because we had moved into a new, a new building with like this old warehouse. And like we were just about to launch a website. And then YouTube came along one day and just put copyright flags on like hundreds of my hundreds of our videos the company at that that time. was the fall of 2013 when they started to uh, initiate a, a broader system even if you were partnered or yeah. or uh, and you were partnered for i think you had your own you you're on your own mcn correct i i've i'm one of the earliest media partners as far as i know Inicom is one of the of 2008 maybe 2007 i'm not even it's, it's somewhere in there because the channel was alive in 07, but I didn't start posting new stuff until 08. But they, they did iron out all that stuff, though, back in by two, by mid-2014. I think that was ironed out, for the most part. Uh, not, yeah. Maybe, maybe it wasn't quite as bad as that one day you go into work and it's like, oh my God, there's like 300 videos that we have to go and fight and the ad revenue just plummeted. And I, you know, at that point, I was like, well, this is... And it had actually been kind of difficult before then, too. So I, I know we were... I was very wary, and I've always been very wary about being an exclusive YouTube show. I felt that was, this has always been a very bad idea to be this exclusive YouTube show. So that was your first, I guess, I guess your second reboot is when you launched your Patreon and you basically came and said, you came out and everyone said, hey, listen guys, I'm going to be straight with you. Uh, I need your support on Patreon because YouTube isn't doing it for me. That was the beginning of 2016, yeah, because we had, by the by the 2015, despite the fact, I think that was those were some of our best videos 2014 and 15, some of the most entertaining classic game room and the undertow team was working really hard. Our views were awful and the ad revenue completely collapsed. The investors pulled out and that was that. So I picked it up in uh, six, I picked it up in 16 and came out and said, yeah, I, I'll, because it was basically a full-time gig, but it's preventing me from doing other jobs. Sure. But, but I loved it. I mean, I created this thing. I, I just love classic game room. I love the style and you know, what it's all about. So yeah, I came out and had a successful Patreon launch and that was the beginning of 16. And uh, from there, I have had 26 months of straight Patreon decline, uh, which I saw within, I think, the third day of that that was going to happen. It's a very, the Patreon model is very strange. It's a very strange model. Never, never, there's like nothing else quite like it. Oh, I think that that's that's how it is for most Patreons. You start off really big, you get the initial yeah. excitement, and then people fall out, or they realize, okay, maybe this isn't worth my time anymore, or they they change their credit card, and they don't get back in. Yeah. I think a lot of people, uh, when they they're on Patreon, a lot of them don't even sometimes probably even look at what's there. You know, they, they said, oh, I'll throw you a couple bucks, like a tip jar, then yeah, they forget about it. You know, that, that it, can I mean, be nobody of- likes nobody likes a subscription fee. A subscription fee is is a, is a drain on everybody. Sure. So that's. I mean, and that's basically what Patreon is. It's a subscription fee. So I saw this coming in 16. And actually, my biggest my biggest gripe with Patreon is at the end of 16, they sent me this email. Like, you were one of the 95% most active patrons on Patreon. Great job, Mark. I'm like, don't email me. Email everybody else. Well, hopefully. Why you tell, I know I was one. I, I know I've been working my ass. You were off keeping to busy. You had your thing. you had your Patreon podcast and things like that. You're posting drawings and stuff, exclusive videos, so that you know I what mean, you're doing. It was a hell of a year. I, I thought there was some, at the end of the year. I had a new studio set up and was put. I, I like some some pretty awesome reviews. I think the, the what, was that review and some of that stuff. Was that your new studio in the um in the big storage warehouse, or was that you were there before 2016? Now I, I ended up I, I condensed my footprint to uh, save save on that that cost, so I ended up moving everything into a much into like two much much smaller rooms. I uh, kept all the stuff. I've still got all the games and everything, but just sort of tightened it all and made a new studio. And then because um, I love that studio, that's where you recorded the the video game year segments, like for Centipede and everything. You had the Centipede in the background. You had, oh, that's was, the uh, warehouse. That was the warehouse. That was the warehouse. That was like four yeah. years ago you recorded that, three, four years ago. The new and, studio is actually very much, is very reminiscent of the warehouse set. That was a good size. And when I started to build the new one again right now for this new relaunch, 
I actually used the warehouse, the no, sorry, not the warehouse, the storage locker studio as a template because it was a very comfortable uh, size to film in. I thought it was amazing. You found a warehouse that you can act as a studio, and you had enough power supplied there and a great lighting that they didn't care that you went in there and filled. I thought that was fantastic. You actually like had a, it's like your own office that you you a lot cheaper than an office is having a storage unit. You know, yeah, that, you know what? We were not the only company doing that. I believe there was actually a couple other tech companies. There was one that was doing like IT repair out of a uh, storage locker, and I think we all got a good kick out of like we're sitting there playing video games or recording these ridiculous shows, and people come in with like their couch to store it. And they're looking, yeah, I, I'm not going to speak. What the hell to the, is this? I'm not going to speak to the legalities of a conducting business, commercial business at a, at a storage unit facility. But if you can only spend a couple hundred bucks, few hundred bucks per month on what amounts to a lot of office space, that's you can't go wrong with that it was a good choice for uh that the time when we just were i think at the time we really weren't sure what direction this this this, this new business which had grown out of nothing again like it's just i don't think any you know we had this little company at the time and i don't think anybody expected it to take off quite like it did and uh, we, we ended up moving into some some warehouse space which wasn't too bad either but uh that's right about yeah that's what right you- about the time it started to peak I was going to say, where did you find all, you had a few pinball machines. Uh, I forget the ones offhand. You had a few arcade machines. Where did you find them? Was this locally Craigslist? You just picked up some uh, machines that you liked? Most Mostly Craigslist. I ended up finding a, uh, a supplier uh, that wasn't far from me that actually made, made some cut some good deals. And uh, it's, the show was doing really well back then. So it was like, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like I want Asteroids. I'm not passing up an Asteroids machine. So Oh, that's one of yeah, my I, favorite original arcade games. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it's... It, it wasn't nearly as as expensive as I think a lot of people think. It, 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 especially if, if you can pick them up, you save a fortune. It's yeah, sure. I, I, I'm looking here and there for myself now that I have a, a a house that I can actually and a garage now that I actually could probably fit five or six machines in. Uh, I'm going to start doing that. I've always wanted a pinball machine. I mean, forever. Back when I was in New Jersey, we had arcade auctions. You know, in the early 2000s, where some of the machines you couldn't give away working arcade machines for 50 bucks i mean i'm not talking like if it was an older game like miss pac-man yeah that would still go for like 700 dollars. but yeah. if it was just like a i don't know pow or even a, a play choice 10 back then you're not spending more than 100 150 on some of those you know it, it was insane neo geo cabinets working 150 bucks back then 125 <laughs> you know that's cheap now yeah it's, it was insane uh, the only thing that the only things that were expensive back then that you could say were comparable now were pinball machines were never that cheap because they're scarce. You, you know, even a mass-produced pinball machine was not made as much as a mass-produced arcade machine. Uh, it just couldn't be. And then, um, like I said, the classic machines were always expensive. Maybe not as na- much as now, but I remember going to ones that even then because yeah, Miss Pac-Man was always popular. So Miss Pac-Man, you see. A, a couple's there, a boyfriend, girlfriend, man, and wife, and you, they want, you can tell they want it for their living room. So they'd spend 900 bucks on a good condition one. They'd be outbidding each other. And that's before they started, you know, reproducing them for like, you know, the Galaga, you know, Pac Man anniversary stuff. That was like before that. You know? Well, the original ones have the CRTs, which are preferable, but they're starting to get old now. And all the, a lot of the, especially the, the monitors need repair, need maintenance and repair work. The joysticks and the boards themselves aren't too bad, but those monitors are a pain in the ass. Yeah, that's a shame that there may not be a solution to that unless you find a someone finds a warehouse of all of them just sitting there, new old stock, you know, just somewhere. Have you ever I'm, seen the uh, Barcade Instagram feed? If you if you look at the Barcade Instagram feed, the occasionally they'll show pictures. They just have a warehouse of CRT monitors. Do they really? Yeah, as far so as they, I know. So they found it. Like they found that that cash that could hopefully I'd, last them. I mean, if if you're gonna have arcade games, you need to buy them from from the old tubes and just stockpile them. I mean, I'm not gonna do that, but this is what some people do. <laughs> sure. Uh, you mentioned before something I thought was interesting. So you, at one point you had investors for, I guess, your business slash YouTube channel. Well, it came out of an early, of an older company, so it was still owned by some of the original owners of the older company. So they they actually had a stake in what you were doing on YouTube. Uh, well, we were a business, and I was the project leader for this thing okay. at the time. So I mean, it was my idea, but it was like the production company of a, of a previous company. So the production company yet you worked for. So you figured, okay, so they partially own the YouTube channel since you were working with them. I see. Everybody, I mean, it wasn't great. It was dying. I mean, it, we, it was bleeding at that point. And it's like, well, it wasn't worth anything. So I picked okay. it up and um, just re- rebooted the whole thing. And here we are. I'm, and I wouldn't say I'm rebooting it again from that standpoint, but I'm definitely rebooting the actual uh, show, which has uh, clearly run its course despite uh, 
despite the fact I think it's been a been a been a wonderful ten years. I've really so, enjoyed it. So you you think it's running course just in terms of the length of time you're doing it? You think the audience has changed? Are, are you tired of doing it in terms of the format? You just need to change or a little bit of everything? Uh, the primary driving factor here is what has happened to YouTube. Okay. What what has happened to YouTube? It used to be fantastic. It used to be a really great company to work with. And now, I mean, I've been doing production work for 20 years. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen a company nosedive in terms of customer service and quality like YouTube. I mean, they have turned into the ultimate hive of scum and villainy. I mean, it's a disgusting digital cesspool. Wow. They, they treat their users like crap. They... I mean, I have contacted them, I don't know how many times, about the theft of my content, and it's been flat out ignored. And I, it just, it... Are you talking about re-uploads? Just so people are just re-uploading your videos and making money off of them? It just, it taking my content, yeah, I mean, they, they take my content, turn them into a top 10 video, and if they're a large channel, I typically have to, you know, I gotta go in like, basically I would have to spend the rest of my life going through like 15,000 videos and like hunting down time codes, which I'm not going to do because I can do other things with that time, so... It's just been an unbelievably frustrating endeavor dealing are you, with. Are you, are you talking you, about? I like, think everybody who works at YouTube should be ashamed of themselves and what they've allowed it to turn into. Wow. Sorry, are you I speaking mean, this, to maybe this terrible uh, platform where kids eat like detergent for hits? I mean, this is this is not a video service anymore. It's just a pile of shit. Mark, how do you really feel? So, top so, top well, ten reasons YouTube is awesome. So when you talk about so we talk about theft of your content, I just want to be clear: Are you talking about someone that is taking your videos wholesale, or are you talking about like taking little snippets of gameplay and maybe inserting them into a which into a top ten, which could be considered fair use? You're talking about someone literally taking chunks of your video and a top ten that. is not fair use. That that is absolutely untrue. A top ten is not fair use. That is not journalism. That is entertainment. That is not fair use. Okay. I mean, I that that is that is absolutely false. Um, so, so you're looking at it that, okay, if you're doing a journalistic review of something and you consider your gameplay uh, in that endeavor fair use, someone taking yes, that, that is fair your use. gameplay, which is, which is not owned by you, that's copyrighted by the company that owns that gameplay, which someone then taking that off of yours, now the journalistic endeavor is out the window. So, so the fair, fair use, in your opinion, is gone at that point. That's at that point. Yes, that, that is theft, especially when they take footage of me or take footage of my hands or take footage of something that I'm working with or use my voice in a video. That's my favorite. Well, I would agree there for sure. Like if they use your voice in a video, then yeah, then you're not, it's not an example of something that they're commentating on at that point. That's, that's yeah, your problem. Yeah. And it's not just me that's frustrated by this. Every single YouTube creator is frustrated by the fact that it, let's say you use like a half second of a song in a video whether it's in the gameplay, maybe you're just recording somewhere and it's in the background. Your video is going to get flagged and you're going to lose your ad revenue because it's going to that that song belongs to a music company. But sure. You know, I've got 10 years of footage which YouTube presumably has the same exact tools. They could go back and sniff all I mean, every you know everything's been watermarked in one form or another by their software. Uh, so they could they could assist me in some way and assist other creators in helping us keep our keep our video intact. Keep, keep our ad revenue intact. I mean, if someone's going to steal the footage, they should either... I mean, the same, the same thing should apply to us that applies to, like, Disney, you know? If someone steals my footage, they should be sniffing it out for me immediately and getting back well, to me you, and getting you that can back do, to me. Technically, you can do content ID through the YouTube system, but that's a laborious process. The whole thing is a laborious process. Yeah. It's, a, it's just... It sucks. But I think what's really changed on YouTube is that it's it's gone from being a video service to a service that rewards spectacle. And of course, we all know the scourge of clickbait. Uh, clickbait, I think, is really pretty much the last straw. I mean, what is the future of YouTube? And um, what kind of content do you do you make for YouTube? If, if there's, there's a lot of people now who make a career on YouTube. I've been one of these people. I've been very fortunate. It's been awesome. But at this point, I have to look at it like, what kind of content do I make on YouTube if I expect this content to do well on YouTube? And it all comes down to clickbait. And I don't want to make clickbait. And my existing content doesn't work. Uh, people don't seem to enjoy it that much. No one clicks on it. So, I mean, that's that. Well, I think you brought up a, an, an issue that I want, I want to parse it out. So you're saying people are enjoying it. I would say if people are watching it, they're still enjoying it. But people aren't necessarily finding it because YouTube is not promoting it. I think that's a different uh, issue. 
right? Well, the the discovery part of it is 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 a huge. The discovery part of it can all be tied down to um, oversaturation combined with search algorithms. I mean, if you're going to have a video come out now, people really have to be extreme about their content or their caption, you know, like, NES, is it worth $200? And you have your big stupid icon and everything. And it's just, you look at this, like, is this about video? Like, I, 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 I'm, I want to make video. And, I, and that's actually the, the whole new show relaunch in my mind is, is a throwback to the 80s when people just watched video without the distraction of this circus surrounding the video. It's just the focus on the video itself and the content on the entertainment quality. So you're discouraged with the over-promotion, the, what, you, what you think is the clickbait titles. like the Yeah, the is it worth the thing I've seen recently pop up in the retro <laughs> genre. Um, and, and People love questions. It's, it's just, you got to wonder, like everyone says that I hate clickbait, yet that's the only thing anyone clicks on. So, you know, I don't know. But isn't also the fault, though, of the audience, or that's just the way the audience they, you know, they're interested in that. It's marketing, right? You know, it, it's like Hydrox versus Oreo. Hydrox it is existed, marketing. Hydrox existed before Oreo, but Oreo yep. got the marketing out there. And now, no, barely anyone except me knows what Hydrox is. It, even I don't. I've heard, I know the name Pat, and I, I just I can put two and two. I can put <laughs> so two Mark, and two together. So here. Mark, I'm not saying it's not bad being Hydrox because it's the original, and I liked Hydrox <laughs> better as a kid than Oreo. It actually tasted better. Uh, but but I guess you're discouraged by the whole ecosystem and by what you see as people and the audience may be getting more fickle and chasing after, you know, content you don't agree with. Could it also be due to the fact, though, that the audiences now on YouTube are a lot younger than when we both started out, uh, oh, you know, because kids are growing up. There's <laughs> five five year olds are not watching TV. They're going right to YouTube. That and is a huge part of it. And a it demographic went, shift for sure. And 10 years ago five-year-olds maybe weren't on YouTube as much. It was the techie people and 20-year-olds and, and teenagers that were on YouTube because YouTube was still new in yeah. 2008, 2007. Yeah, it's a very different atmosphere now than it was then. It's a very different atmosphere now than it was in 2012. The demographics have shifted. People's expectations have shifted. What drives clicks has changed yet when when you have a channel, I, 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 find, I found over the years that people just expect it to stay the same way but when the same way isn't working, uh, I'm, I'm forced to make a change. Sure. Um, I, I don't like to use the word discouraged because at this point, I just don't give a shit. Like, I, I'm just sick of them. And YouTube, it, you know, if, you're, if your point is to make clickbait, YouTube is a great, great place. It's a good place for vlogging. It's a good place for how-to videos. Actually, I think how-to how -to videos are terrific on YouTube because you search for something and it pulls right up. Um, and I think YouTube is, is good for marketing, but it's not good for actual content <laughs> it's not good for like if you're i'm trying to think of the best way to say this there's sort of like three different kinds of people who make content for youtube there's like people starting out or people who are doing it for fun and to them it's all just it's you know it's all open the whole thing is wide open it's all you can do whatever it's all it, it's growth it's all growth for you then there's the people on top like logan paul your pewdiepie like you know they're they're the kings of YouTube. YouTube loves them. I don't care what they say. YouTube loves them because they bring in views, they bring in promotion. They probably well, have a painting of Logan Paul in their boardroom. Not and so much anymore due to the bad publicity. <laughs> bad publicity is still publicity. I don't believe that. I, I mean they, they they he's like a he's creation of of what's happened on YouTube. And then there's the people in the middle. Uh, and I'm a, I'm one of those people. And that's that's the worst place to be because you're still making a living on YouTube, but your audience expects you, I think, to make certain kind of product. But when that certain kind of product is destined to not get any views on YouTube, you have to wonder, is it the product that's bad or the venue itself that's incompatible with what you're making? Do you feel um, uh, uh, this isn't against you personally, or it could be me and others at the same time. Do you think people like us in the quote unquote middle class, we've taken for granted where we are on YouTube or haven't thought about it could be worse. Do you think about that at times that, hey, I've had a good run. This is fantastic because, you know what I mean? Because I think to get to the point that we got to uh, is rare. Very, we're, we're the top, even though we're not making millions of dollars. I don't make, I don't even make uh, six figures on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> not even close to it. Do you, I think my do last video made ten bucks. I had like seven thousand hits, Pat. <laughs> but do, do you still feel fortunate though for where you are, where you're at, uh, Pat? To have the opportunity that I've had is extremely fortunate. Um, I, I can't thank the viewers enough. It's just been, it's been a ride that I never expected to have. Sure. And I wouldn't change it for anything. 
Uh, and at the end of the day, I'm very disappointed. I don't like to use the word discouraged. Discouraged means I care. Disappointed is more accurate. Dis- I'm very disappointed in the direction that YouTube as a company has taken. And I don't like the way that they've treated their longtime users. I mean, you, you and I have both been on there for a long time. I've caused zero problems. I've never made a video attacking anyone. I've never stolen anyone's footage. And, you know, I've just, I mean, I have, God knows how many of these stupid copyright flags. I have people coming in all over the place falsely claiming videos. I got like, I've had to remove all my sports game and music game reviews because of uh, some errant copyright strikes on that, which shouldn't have applied because they were journalism. Um, and then there's the content theft. Then you've got you know, sh- shrinking viewership. In 2007, I had the writing was on the wall that I needed to leave the documentary career. In 2017, the writing was on the wall that I should probably start to consider a career beyond running a YouTube channel. Even though I've been, even though I was fairly successful at um, working with external financing and crowdfunding, uh, the, the, if you draw the lines out, it's not looking good. But but, um, but a couple a couple interesting things have happened since since the uh, beginning of 2017 when I had to make some tough decisions. I decided actually to um, effectively take another job uh, since the earnings had continued to plummet. And when when you're running a business and you draw your line out, you're like, oh god, the end of the year is not going to look so good. This was 2017. You took on a new job. Yeah, I took. I mean, I ended up creating my own job, but. I basically ended up making another job, uh, which is my publishing business. I went back into my writing and art career uh, while also continuing to run Classic Game Room and continuing to support the Patreon deliverables and ended up uh, producing. I, I haven't actually counted. I think I've ended up releasing 10 books in 2017. I'm looking at your page right now at ClassicGameRoom.com. Just on the front page, I'm guessing this is all your books and graphic novels. There's 20 listed here. That might that include so- some of the video collection stuff as well, but definitely okay. at, least, at least ten books. Um, oh, oh, that includes it, the, that, clu- that includes the the Amazon Video Direct stuff. Okay, I just I had so much fun last year just getting back into writing, and I found writing actually to be very therapeutic and a big change from the grind of uh, YouTube, which which as you can probably tell, I'm just f- frustrated and discouraged and disappointed with all of it. Um, it was just so much fun to get back into writing and publishing, and then the response has been incredible. The ultra massive video game console guide, volume one and two. Uh, you have the Switch Collector's Review Guide. Wild Nintendo was brilliant. Uh, you also have the best PlayStation Four reviews. Oh, that was oh, that's an Amazon Prime. That's the Video Direct. That's okay. Amazon Video. Uh, you also have your art books on here. Your comic books from the last twenty plus years. You have your old timey pictures with silly captions. Volume one. You have the the White City of Color. I guess the book version of the documentary you did. Uh, uh, totally, so- totally separate book, unrelated to the documentary. But oh, it's unrelated. Uh, it, okay, it is on the eighteen ninety three World's Fair. But okay, but you you have a lot of stuff going on here. So a lot of these you published within the past few years. But you said you did ten last year. I mean, I do a lot of work with um, layout and photo design work. I did one called uh, Ultra Massive Photographic Adventure of of the eighteen ninety three World's Fair, uh, where I went. Through, I have this monstrous collection of photographs, um, and I went back through them and actually just took a lot of stuff that was, as far as I know, unpublished and actually put it in that book. And I've heard from fair collectors that they love it because there's so much of this stuff unpublished and the print quality. I mean, this, I mean that's what I know how to do. I know how to make this stuff look really good. So I ended up working with um, some, some pretty awesome software and put together a great book. And I'm working with Amazon on the publishing on that. The ultra, the color ones are the White City of Color book turned out very nice. That's uh, it's actually done pretty well. There's and I have uh, two more 1893 World's Fair books coming out this year. I also have <laughs> you I like have a the book World's Fair. The, <laughs> I know a lot about it. I got a ton of stuff on it. It's actually a fascinating event, and I think more relevant than ever in today's climate. And I'm also working on a 1939 World's Fair documentary film based on a 16 millimeter reel of footage. I'm having converted to 4K and putting out a corresponding book on that. Wow, so this is footage that hasn't been released before. Or it was a private collection. Someone had it. Never the been. Uh, has not been released. I think I put some of it out like ten years ago. Um, but this, I'm having it all retransferred. It was it was an idea I had ten years ago, and then got tabled because of all the classic game room stuff. But now I'm bringing it back. 
Sure. So obviously these are different audiences and there's some overlap, but you have people that, that are into the, you know, World's Fair history and stuff from the late 1800s, which is interesting because that's when technology took that step up with electricity. Oh yeah. That's uh, actually, that's what's fun about cars, the old timey pictures. Steam, steam power. You know, it was, a you know, Tesla Edison getting up there. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the, the telephone, the radio, Marconi, right? So you had a really interesting point in history where you know, in the past 120 years, 130 years to get to where we are now. But it seems like your interest is there, is there too. And that's a different audience than oh, yeah. necessarily retro audience. games. Yeah, I mean, there's a, obviously some some of the classic game room viewers find that stuff pretty interesting. And I've heard from them that they've, they've enjoyed it. But it is predominantly a different audience. I think it's good to have actually multiple audiences diversify. Let me ask you, how do you, I mean, this is something that I see and struggle with and would question for myself. Um, how do you first of all, put out this amount of content and not feel like the quality is going to decline if you put out 10 books a year. To me, that's insane uh, to do that. So you, you must have a regimen and you're very disciplined in order to say, okay, this is what I want. I'm not taking shortcuts. You know, this has been edited properly, proofed. How do you, how do you maintain that sort of discipline and make sure that you're putting out all these quality products as quickly as you are? Uh, well, first of all, I know the design stuff inside and out. So I think I've noticed okay. a lot of writer, a lot of writers struggle with the design work, and my my background's in design, so I just cruise right through that. Uh, when it comes to the actual content, uh, depending on the book, uh, the ultra massive books are by far the hardest to write. But I know the material really well. I mean, that's all the stuff I learned by doing classic game room. It's all in video games, uh, and those are my best selling books by far. The ultra massive books, and they took a long time to make, but also I find. Uh, when writing books, I tend to just unwind like at night with a laptop and just just go through it for an hour and just, just write and proofread and do the QA work. And I run stuff through uh, software for spell checking. And I, I, the quality has actually been, I, I think, terrific. The really pleased with those, actually. The Ultra Massive books. Are, I'm finishing the third one right now. Why do we uh, always but, use Ultra in all the titles of our books? <laughs> or ultimate we always you're ult <laughs> well, you're ultimate i'm you're ultimate, the ultimate. You're ultra. <laughs> I'm, I'm, ul I'm ultra you're ultimate uh <laughs> we can't cross the streams like i can't do an ultra book you can't do ultimate we're gonna we'll sue each other I, I, um. I think i think you come first alphabetically though so you've got it's <laughs> oh, like it's like it a, it's like a claim in activision i was thinking about that in, in the video game book uh library i believe i'm gonna come right before mark Right before. <laughs> yeah. And so something the, like, uh, I mean, if you look at a book like Old Timey Pictures with Silly Captions, I mean, that didn't, I mean, that's mostly just comics. It's I took these old pictures from 1890s newspapers, French newspapers, that were these innocent pictures of the dawn of technology and basically gave them all filthy captions, uh -huh. which is, if you know me, that's just exactly who I am. <laughs> uh, the, the, that the wasn't hard to do. The feedback's been good in that book. People are enjoying it. That came out the very, very, that's the last book I put out, actually. It came out the very end of last year. I didn't have much time to market it, but the feedback I have heard is good. It's pretty funny. That's pretty good. And these are all published via Amazon's uh, independent publishing. I've been working with Amazon, and I'm very pleased with it. I think that you know, there's only, in technology, there's only five companies that amount to anything. We all know who they are. Amazon's one of them, and they're just, they're doing so many great things for uh, what I call a higher end market. I mean, I think YouTube is just, it's just click, just clickbait and just spectacle. I mean, that's like their whole reason for existing these days. I mean, like what, what's this recent thing where kids are eating detergent? I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> well, kids are going to be kids and be stupid. I mean, you can't change that. Right? I am so, <laughs> I, you have no idea how happy I am. This stuff did not exist when I was in high school and college. <laughs> Well, I can't even imagine because I'd have been like, look at me, look what I'm doing. I mean, I'd have been doing exactly what they're doing. I can't even blame them. And I hear about the fallout from some of these big guys, you know, like your Logan Paul or whatever. And the thing is, they are kids and kids are going to make mistakes, but they're making mistakes on such a large well, public scale. Oh, Logan Paul's not a kid. He's a grown man. Uh, but his, but his are audience like are kids. What's that? I thought he was a teenager. I don't know. He's, tw he's like 22. So we're talking about college graduate. That's you still know, pretty age. Young, but yeah, but I would say I wouldn't give him the credit you're giving him. He's like, he should know better. 
you know, PewDiePie should know better. He's older than 22. He's closer, I think, to 30 at this point. These people should know better, know what their audience is. That's always my argument. You know that your preteens and impressionable youth are watching your videos. Maybe not throw around, you know, Nazi stuff like it's going out of fashion. You well, know? In, but anyway, he, as as you see, you're pretty you're pretty in tune with this stuff. See, here's what's. I thought about this before we started talking. I mean, here's what's going to happen is well that the mark adver- prediction. <laughs> My prediction is, and you're seeing this happen. We just, I think it was just last week. Didn't Unilever, Unilever come out and tell YouTube or tell Google and Facebook to clean up their act? Basically, like they're, they're they don't want their ads next to offensive videos, hurtful videos, dangerous videos. I mean, this in the ad, these advertisers are going are going the advertisers are going to drive the direction. Oh, of absolutely, YouTube. that's what happened last year with the apocalypse. And that's absolutely. why you're seeing YouTube right now starting to put up more restrictions on who can earn ads and it's only going to continue to get tighter and tighter and I think I I swear I could be making this up, but all right, Microsoft just just released re- not too long ago put out their Mixer service, which is like Twitch for Xbox or it's from Microsoft. I just tried that the other day. It actually works. It's called Mixer. It actually it works. <laughs> it does. It, it, it's I, not I, broken. I was, I was hooking up a new Xbox One. I'm like, what the hell's this? And then like the next day I saw something on CNN, like, you know, Mix, Mixer competes with Twitch. And I'm like, oh, I just saw that. So I tried it and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Um, but I think I read the fine print and it's like, you know, there's, there's some people making you know, big, that are like Mixer celebrities already or whatever. But like, I think they, they're kind of under control. Like, I don't think they're allowed to act out publicly. And you start, so you're going to see these controls come out. They're like, okay, you could be a big YouTube star, but you're, you're, you're not going to be allowed to like, you know, put your arm on a stove. <laughs> if, if these kids are watching like you can't do this and so suddenly well they're, well, they're getting there right twitch just put out a terms of service like that it's going to be the disney channel um and in in in, in as as a parent that's not necessarily a bad thing if these kids are going to watch this content i mean i can't let my family watch like we love edit station one everybody here loves edit station one i couldn't let them watch my recent edit station one video because of the, the horrible comments on there so anything i put on at this point I'm just deactivating all the comments. I mean, it, YouTube is not going to clean up their site fast enough for me as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there's no reason to leave inappropriate comments on a video which is not an offensive video. I just think that's ridiculous. Okay, so let's get into it because with the, we'll, we'll, we'll parse out a couple of things off of here. Uh, so we're talking about Amazon Video Direct also popping up the past couple of years, allowing you know, Prime becoming bigger and bigger. So they have a, you you sign up for Prime for a year for like, what is it, 90 bucks and you get free shipping, you get all these myriad of benefits. Amazon Prime is is probably worth it. You got to back up. Hold on. The best thing that you get with Amazon Prime is ALF. ALF? Is ALF on there? (laughs) ALF is on Amazon Prime. I mean, Classic Game Room will be on there, but whatever. That sucks compared to ALF. ALF is what you're there for. Also, the the new Van Damme show is on there. It is. So now they have they have exclusive series the past few years, the same way now Hulu does and even like AT&T and T does Netflix for their, and H- Netflix and HBO. Does. Yeah, they yeah. all do. So the, so the point is this now, now they've allowed user uploads to have shows. And so you've taken advantage of that. Video game years is also on there. And You're so there. I think for someone like you, that's a platform you see as okay, this is higher quality, more um It's an older audience. It is an older audience. It's it's a paid audience. It's a, it's a subscription audience. So that inherently is older. You got to have a credit card, and thirteen year olds usually don't have credit cards. So that's what you're more geared towards, maybe, and that's where you're you you're now seeing the future of, of your show. Yeah, I, I uh, if if I continue running Classic Game Room like it is, it will be. I'll have to close it up by the end of this year. Uh, so I, I saw that at the end of 2017. Like, wow. You, Really got to figure out what to do with Classic Game Room in 20, 2018. I mean, the Patreon audience has been has been wonderful and they've been supportive, but everybody I think is starting to say, "Can you can you make it? Can you make it bigger? Can you do a little more?" And then, yes, I can do it, but I can't give it to YouTube to steal and then have somebody mix into their videos. I, I can't do that, and then the ad revenue is all gone, and the audience doesn't isn't there anyway. So. You know, you know what happened is I was so busy with everything in 17, I didn't even notice until the end of the year, until December. I opened up this screen one day and I was just going through all the stuff, sort of looking at like how the year went. You know, it, just, it was middle of the holiday season, which was awesome. So thank you to everybody who picked up one of my books, by the way. I know a lot of my viewers have done that and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. But I, I just looked at the screen. And I'm like, wait a second. People are watching my videos on Amazon for like the first time in two years. 
and I started to see a comment. So I saw a comment on Instagram. Like, I just found your video on Amazon Prime. It's awesome. You know, it's, it's great seeing this. I'm like, what, really? Wait, hold on now. What's going on here? So people are actually watching my stuff on Amazon. And they seem to enjoy it. And people love the books. And I'm just about to build, like, this temporary set to finish up um, something I call CGR Feature Review, which are larger, like, film-like projects that I had kickstarted last year. And I'm about to build the set. Like, you know what? You, I, I, I draw the, I've drawn, I've drawn these lines out. I've looked at the financials. I know YouTube is the YouTube and Patreon thing is going to be pretty much non-existent by the end of the year. Maybe, maybe it's time to just, you know, let's just fucking reboot this thing. Let's just see what happens and just do something totally, completely different. And I let the Patreon audience know in January what was coming in case they all wanted to dive out. I mean, I just gave you. Contrary to what people seem to think, I do not scam my Patreon audience. <laughs> um, unless you're in the Patreon audience, you don't really know what's going on. It's one of the other problems with Patreon. So I let them all know in case they all wanted to dive out before the end of January and um, you know, not get charged so you, for so it. So you, you let your patrons out, hey, the YouTube show is going to be coming to a crawl at this point. I'm going to be focusing on my Amazon Prime show that you're in. And that's Classic Game Room 2085, correct? And that's going to launch in March. 2080. I'm planning to launch it in March. You know how Amazon is if you've worked with them before. I mean, it's, it's not like YouTube where you upload something and it's there. It's a much, sure. much, much more elaborate process. Sure. Uh, but yes, I did let them know, like, look, I'm going to actually just, I'm going to, I'm looking into discontinuing the, the YouTube show for this long list of reasons that, you know, I've already told you with some colorful language. Um, but here's the cool thing is I'm going to Basically, just bring like just supersize the show and turn it into a giant TV show. So, Classic Game Room 2085 is a combination of Top Gear, Hee Haw, and Buck Rogers. I'm sorry, Top Gear. What was the second thing? Hee Haw and Buck Rogers. Top Gear, Hee Haw, which is a is a Southern baked comedy variety show, right? And then Buck Rogers. Okay, we're, we're that's a lot to. Uh, that's a lot to examine Pat, right there. Pat, I, I had someone actually message me the other day and said, well, you're doing something very controversial. I'm like, there's nothing controversial. About you got to be kidding me. You got to look at what's on YouTube. Can I make something for YouTube? No, I can't. I, I can't make a show for YouTube unless I go and make reaction videos and top 10 videos. But, you know, damn it, I can make an awesome 45 to 60 minute television show. I know exactly how to do that. And I sat down and I started and I built it took me three weeks to build the set, and I worked with the. I, I sent Patreon backers the whole process, so they got to see the whole thing from from the ground up, uh, building the set. And I sat down, and started recording. And I'm like, you know, damn it, I'm having fun again. This is actually fun. Now I, I can kind of wrap my head around this because it's not just a game review; it's a combination of things. I mean, imagine it has a game review, but there's also like hardware comparisons and just like software competition. I've got like Vectrex versus Switch in the uh, second episode. I've got uh, viewer q and A's. I'm looking at some cables and it's just the production qualities. I'm working with all of my uh, real photography equipment at the moment, which is gorgeous. Um, it's just, you know, real. So I'm putting like real filmmaking back into it. Up, and it's going to be more of a it's going to be a weekly show rather than this thing where I'm constantly trying to chase my tail on YouTube and so, know, keep, okay. keep up with everything. So it's a weekly show. We talked about this on the CU podcast a little bit. I believe you told me it's going to be like the typical hour on TV is like 44 minutes, 45 minutes in theory without commercials. So yeah. we'll just say like a 45 minute show. You're going to aim for a weekly. It's aim going to be hee haw. As well, which I'm guessing means like skits or comedy in there as well. I, I like to throw hee haw in there because uh, not don't take that one so literally. It's it's okay. more just it's more just that it's if you even know what hee haw is, you're you're my demographic. Uh, <laughs> let's just say uh, that forty five and up is the hee haw audience. Just to let you know. Well, well, I, yeah, I'm not quite forty five yet, but I love that old seventy stuff and like Buck Rogers. It's seventy I mean, stuff. Buck Rogers is seventy. Top Gear is a new is a newish show where it's like half. You know, car reviews and travel show, and they get Top into Gear trouble. Top Gear does a great. You know, what Top Gear has always done a really good job at is they have uh, managed to contain. They've managed to pa to mix journalism with entertainment. Uh, enter enter entertainment and the, the pacing of. I mean, they just they know their pacing. I mean, if you look at just classic television pacing, Top Gear has or the Grand Tour now on Amazon Prime. It's another one of their shows now. Amazon Prime's Grand Tour has perfect pacing. And as an editor, it's, I mean, I looked at, I'm, I just watched my first two shows. I mean, that's the kind of pacing I, I use. I use television style pacing. 
you know, you don't, you don't want to have these things just run too long. It's all fairly short. It's a really tight edit. And it's just, it's tons of fun. So you're going to aim for the weekly show about 45 minutes. And are you going to have others involved with the editing and writing and shooting? Or is it still a one man gang at this point? Uh, edit station one is actually the director. So there, there is a broken computer. Who's the director of the show. There's a broken computer. That's the director. Okay. Uh, he's a, he's a sentient broken computer. He's, 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 he's crazy. So there is a wacky sidekick involved. Um, you know, you can run a one man show. If you know what you're doing, it takes a lot of time. I, I think you know that. I mean, as long so you because because you're doing everything. But if you know if you know how to do it, you can do it. Time is the most expensive uh, part of this for sure. It, it took me six days to make the first show, and I expect it to get more efficient as I continue going. So you're hoping that you can get it down to a science, like producing a real television show where they do about one a week. You get into a process. You can have some time off in between. And then you can build that. Are you going to try to release them in seasons, like a traditional show? Or are you just going to do like an upload, like one at a time, and then let your let your followers know about the episode that's out? I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to release them. I will tell you that I'm working ahead on it for sure. And this is also something I've kept the Patreon audience up to date on this stuff since they're effectively financing it. Um, you know, this is this is what it's going to be like. You know, there's. there's uh, say four. The, I think the first four are uh, more or less complete. The first two are totally done. The second one is a review of Zarlor Mercenary and the Lynx combined with a look at the Lynx one uh, compared to the Lynx two. And the fourth one is a in depth look at the wonderful analog Super NT and um, some pretty fun moments in that one. So these are all parts of the first few episodes. Yeah, there, there, there's. No one running theme per se, but it sh it should be very. I think that's what people have wanted the show to be for a long time, but I've I've just been unable to do this on YouTube. It would so just you're looking fail, you're looking at fail miserably say, on YouTube. Multiple subjects per forty five minute video. You're going to segue from one to the other and do that. Uh, and bet. obviously, and obviously that helps with the Amazon uh, Prime Video Direct algorithm, where the longer something's watched, the more revenue you earn. Um, so that helps there too. That, that's does, that, that is how Amazon and think. I, what I love about Amazon Prime is that you can't get ad blocked. I don't. Th I don't think viewers know how difficult it is right now being a creator on YouTube. You have like, every force in the world against you, including ad blocker. <laughs> it's. I, I, I say if you like a show, I mean, if you're watching a show that's been on regularly and you like the creators of the show or the creator of the show, I mean, you, you, you support them. It is so hard right now. Um, I would say it's almost impossible, which is why I've just taken efforts to expand and diversify. Sure. Like, like you said last time, we talked cogs on a wheel, Pat, cogs on a wheel. So is there, um, I see you put up the classic game room, 2085, 2085, 2085, 2000. <laughs> and so the video goes up on YouTube a month ago. This was after you did your last review on YouTube, which was Vindicators. And, um, it wasn't overtly an announcement in terms of the traditional sense saying, okay, this is coming. This is what the show is going to be. And this is where it is. Are you going to do a video like that at some point? Once the show is live saying, hey, YouTube audience, this is where I am now. This is the future going forward. Come check me out. I would like to. I, I find that the YouTube audience is sort of spl is split in that you have people who love YouTube and only want YouTube. It, I mean, YouTube, YouTube is a miracle of the modern age, Pat. It gives us all this free content. I mean, I can totally understand why people love YouTube. Uh, the other half of the audience I, likes classic game room, so I'm hoping they will give it a chance. Uh, please understand, there's just no way to continue working with YouTube, especially with the kind of content that I make. I mean, it's just dead. It will die. It already is dead. It's just bleeding a slow death on YouTube at the moment. So yeah, I did. I put that up as a teaser. The actual trailer is up on Instagram. So and it's on Instagram, but it's not on YouTube. Okay. Not yet. I, I'd you know I'd like to know what the firm date's going to be, and I'm still. Uh, waiting to hear actually what it's going to be on this. So I'm hoping March, but yeah, I'm just, I'm pushing ahead no matter what. If you know, worst comes to worst, Pat, I'm just going to release it on VHS. You know, fuck it. VHS, you're going to mail out everyone a copy? I guess it's a million VHS tapes, right? Get those third generation VHS dubs out there. It's like, it's like, it's like watching through a wall of Vaseline and grime. So um, you say so, that like it's a bad thing. 
No, uh, the DVD uh, revolution was great. Uh, VHS was trash. I knew that when I was seven. This is like, why am I watching the fifth time I'm watching uh, the Goonies? I I can't hear shit anymore. I could hear the first time. You know, it's (laughs) the tracking was awful. I I, I don't get that part of nostalgia. Oh, we have tracking and it's wobbly and and it's like, no, that was awful. I'm sorry. I want to be able to hear what I'm watching. VHS is, is (laughs) is a media format that's best left in the past. It's not nearly as cool as Laserdisc and it's not actually good like analog, like vinyl is actually good. Yes. There's actually a, there's actually a reason to want to listen to vinyl. There's not a positive reason in the world to have VHS. No, no, none there's whatsoever. Not, <laughs> so what are you gonna? What do you say to those YouTube uh, fans that like your work, have followed you for for ten years, and now maybe for one reason or another they won't be able to follow you your show and you and your work to Amazon Prime. Will you kick something back to them every once in a while, perhaps still on YouTube? Sort of like, hey, I'm still here. I'm still around. You know, that's the most challenging part of this is I, I don't want to have to make this change, but I'm being uh, forced into it uh, for, for just very obvious business reasons. If you look at the, uh, the trajectory this is all taking at the moment, um, I would say, please give it a chance. I, you don't even need to have Amazon Prime. You can actually just check out an episode if you just you know, want to see what an episode is. Uh, definitely some international issues, but just watching how Amazon's working, I have a feeling they're going to probably solve those problems sooner rather than later. Well, it's only four countries right now. You have Germany, Japan, uh, UK, and US. And they just made Germany and uh, Japan a lot harder. Oh, they did? I didn't know that part. Yeah, they're oh. requiring subtitles for uh, translated subtitles, which is unbelievably really? expensive. I did not know that. So yeah. maybe... If- and that's the other thing we'll talk about talk about uh, for the 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 gateway for the Amazon video direct is that you need captions for all your uploads. Yeah. So so it's not just you can upload vlogs every day. It's, no, they're looking it's for expensive. content that's decent that they have to say, okay, this is good enough for our platform. It's expensive. Um, it adds up fast, especially if you have a lot of content. Sure. We had, to, we had to dish out the money. Unfortunately, the videos, I think, were too long when they were originally uploaded because I think YouTube does do auto captions for some videos, I believe. YouTube you is so file. good at distributing content to people, but they're just, they're just, so, they're just so terrible towards their creators. You know, and, and, and on the flip side, you've got a company like Amazon, which is taking a very different approach. I think they're far more reasonable to work with, or at least they have like much clearer um, rules like you know they don't just like change their algorithm every week they don't just change how they're going to pay you every week it's like here's your here's here's what you do here's what you get period <laughs> sure so what um, um okay so this is obviously i don't wish this to happen to you what happens though if some there's a massive change to how amazon video direct does business or it doesn't make sense would you consider another platform like steam it would you come back to youtube and say hey i'm back or I mean, have you thought about that? I mean, because any platform can change over time. This is true. I mean, a- a- anything can change. I will. This is the last go at it. I mean, if this doesn't work, this I'm is done. it. I'm done. Amazon I'm Prime going, is it? I'm going. And if this doesn't. I mean, I've, I've actually turned down two publishing offers already for book works. Uh, for book book work, um, I've got some other people that want to work with me on things. I'm keeping that at bay until I decide what I'm doing with the rest of my publishing stuff. You've turned uh, down ideas for you to publish other people's ideas. Yeah, I got a couple. I'm just waiting. Waiting. What do you call it? Waiting in the wings. I just, just, just waiting. <laughs> just, I'm like, hold on, wait, wait and see what happens. Let's let's wait and see where where this is all going because I'm actually pretty excited about the show relaunch because I just love the idea of making it bigger and better. It's sure. very frustrating having to sort of dislodge it from YouTube, and it's it's. I don't fully understand why some people seem to think I signed a lifetime distri- dis, uh, distribution agreement with them, which I did not. I mean, you should. You should not do that. Um, so it's a very frustrating move, but I knew that was going to be frustrating. Um, but I wanted to focus on a show that was a show where I didn't have to worry about engineering it to appeal to YouTube clickbait, which is what you have to do. I mean, if you're making content for YouTube, you can't just make good content and hope people find it because they won't. They won't find it. You have to make it for for the YouTube audience. And you know, that's not my, like we already said, that's not my demographic. I'm just way too old for that. And I guessing you you're not interested in doing Twitch at all. You're not interested in live streaming. No. Any no, gameplay? No. I mean, I a Twitch is kind of fun if I'm just bullshitting with some viewers and like we're hanging out and 
I, I do that occasionally, but no, I, I, the Twitch model is another alternative, I think, for people who are looking, who are possibly getting frustrated with YouTube, because I'm not the only one that's getting frustrated with YouTube. <laughs> I think you know that. Um, Twitch is another option, but it's, it's very different. And as we've already discussed, Twitch is, a, is an incredible time commitment that actually prevents you from doing pretty much everything else. Sure. At the same time, though, it's it's instant content. You don't have to edit. You just you're doing it and it's done. Yeah, some people you know, are good at that. Some people aren't. I'm actually not good at that. I'm I'm a, I'm a okay. much better editor and uh, content creator of, of edited of edited material than I am just a live streamer. I'm not good at that stuff at all. So, so the idea of publishing others' books is starting to interest you. Like they come to you, you help do the layout potentially. Maybe I don't know. Potentially, well, real publishers front cash in some in some aspects and then take a cut of the, you know, the, f the final uh, That's revenue. Something I'm that's something I'm looking at, but actually I've had such good luck, or I should say such some some such great results so far just working on my own content. My next ultra massive book is, should, be, should be out in like April. And the one after that is going to be an ultra, ultra massive Sega Genesis collector's guide. And the one after that is going to be the ultra massive Vectrex collector's uh -oh. guide. Oh, are you going to do the uh, the ultimate Nintendo version of the Sega Genesis library? Is that what it sounds like? Well, well gonna... I, can't, I can't use the word ultimate, Pat. Isn't that yours? <laughs> hey. I don't have a trademark. I'm just saying. You can do but is that what you do? You're, you're going to do a book about the entire library of Sega Genesis games, or a, a chunk of the classic ones at least? Uh, you know, not an entire library. I mean, you. Okay. You're, to your credit, I don't know how you did that, man. That book is your book. I don't is know either. Huge. <laughs> how am no, I doing my, the Super Nintendo one? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, I, I just do a very different style of book. It's, it's going to be on a chunk of the library, collecting advice, uh, my favorite games. A lot of just it's sort of like the ultra massive video game console got just nice, good looking pictures, a nice read, a good collectible, uh, good collectible book. I have a I have a rough template down for that. The Vectrex one I started photography on last year. And I'm looking into other game consoles, like Atari 2600 is obviously pretty high on my list. Sure. And maybe Ellie, I may even encroach in your space someday and work on the NES stuff. But my library is not nearly as big. Hey, as, as I, don't, of, I don't, I don't, I don't own the genre. As there's, some there's other, there's other NES books out there. But, you know. Um, no, I, you know, the the show reboot has to happen. I just, I mean, I thank you so much to everybody who's watched for ten years, especially now on the ten year anniversary as I'm recording this. I, when I, I mean, I don't, maybe it's just me. I don't know. When I even go to like upload something to YouTube, I just get anxious and just upset just knowing how much better they could have made it than it is. Uh, and I are just, you, I, are, I don't like what they've turned their site into. I just, I don't like the reaction that I've received when I say, yo, guys, I've had 10 years of content. People have stolen it. You know who the repeat offenders are. Could you please tell me what you're going to do about it? And I hear nothing. I, I, they're just, they, what are they doing? to their creators unless you're one of their top creators it's like you get you get terrible service like, you don't you don't have a you don't have a a uh, direct google rep that you talk to or youtube rep that you can get in touch I, with i talked to someone and i told them about this and it's like all right you know at some point i'm not going to go back and chase 15,000 videos through time code i mean sure or, or god knows how many billions or trillions of videos are up there already yeah, it, it, this should not have been allowed to happen. I mean, I, I agree with actually some of YouTube's changes from the standpoint of safety, especially from a parental safety. I agree that they should not be letting everybody make ad revenue on their videos, not because I don't think people should be able to create content and learn and grow, but because it prevents the people from just coming out and making terrible content right out of the gate, you know? Uh, I think that the it's it's getting more challenging every single day for new content creators on YouTube and everywhere else on the internet. This is not just YouTube, it's everywhere. It's just getting more comp more competitive and I think the tastes keep getting younger and younger and younger and they they keep they seem to be getting just more extreme in terms of what they're doing to get attention and that's where I think a lot of the dangerous stuff comes in where you have people doing potentially harmful things. And this, of course, infuriates advertisers. So in the, yeah, in the end, where does it all end up? It ends up at the Disney Channel. <laughs> well, then at least it's curated content in some aspect. And, you know, uh, creators are held accountable. Like, like, like they, they demonetized Logan Paul. I don't know for how long, but they that, that hurt him financially, at least in some aspect. And they, they got him off of the uh, Google preferred list. The same thing with PewDiePie, which means you don't get those uh premium ads that are worth a lot more so they are punishing people at bad actors a little bit at least i think so, okay. it's the beginning of their they're they're start what are they they're hiring like ten thousand more people to do content control 
to manually look at videos that get flagged and because the machine learning isn't perfect. So they're taking steps. They are taking they are steps. Reacting. Uh, yeah. To their credit, they are taking steps. I don't see I don't see YouTube as the home for the kind of content that I produce and that I'm going to produce. And I'm taking a stab at a much bigger, longer format show that's perfect for Amazon. I feel conflicted, frustrated, and... Uh, agitated that th this sort of upends a lot of the viewers who have enjoyed my content on YouTube because I appreciate that so much. But at the same time, I, I just, it's not my fault. It's YouTube's fault. And I think a lot of creators need to step up and maybe challenge YouTube a little bit on this I mean, because, because viewers tend to just blame the creator for everything. And if you think about a show that's been canceled, like let's think about an awesome show that's been canceled, like Firefly an awesome show that was canceled. I mean, you don't tend to blame the cast and the crew. You blame the evil, you know, publisher or the, or the, or the network or whatever, whoever published this show. You don't blame the people who made it. In the case of YouTube, if you're a one-person operation, you know, you're acting sure. as the producer and the creator, so you've got to make the tough calls. And this this is a tough call. But it's, I would also it's, say, it's though, a call I have to make. Audience tastes do change, though, as well. Over 10 years, a lot of things can change. People might, be, might leave YouTube. You know, the audiences get older, um, you know, like NES stuff in general does, is in the retro scene is not as popular as it once was. Now it's 16 bit and even later era is more popular because it shifts with the with the time in terms it of the generations. PlayStation is pretty popular now, I hear. But I, I don't know, from my perspective, I'm actually more fascinated by the Atari and like the Genesis era and the Vectrex stuff, you know, behind the scenes. This is, you don't see this as much on, on like, especially on YouTube or on Twitter or whatnot. But behind the scenes, the feedback has been incredibly supportive. Uh, I have, I tend to have an older audience, and they also are fed up with the junk on YouTube. And they're like, you know, this is this is a better atmosphere to watch the show. I think this is a good move for you. Uh, good. Well, there you go. So, are you gonna gonna do videos every once in a while still on YouTube that are not really like you've done these? Uh, you've done a how to draw a cartoon panda video that came out in the last week. Uh, you did. A, I did a Adobe InDesign. What's that? I, I have a series of how-to books I'm putting out. Um, so is that, how, is that what your YouTube draw. channel might... Will your YouTube channel cater perhaps to that in the future? I still have a YouTube channel. This is a channel I've built from uh, the ground up. I am contemplating... I don't want to say repurposing it because it's been... It's, like, it's not like the... I don't plan to send the old stuff away or anything. Sure. Um, but I am planning to continue uh, working with how-to videos... But at the same time, I also, once I start getting into serious actual show production, I realize how little time I have left. Uh, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. I mean, something like how to draw a, an animal or how to draw a whatever. I mean, that takes five or six minutes. There's no editing. It's just me filming the iPad or the, or the Wacom or something. And it just, YouTube is great for that. YouTube well, is you not be, good for heavily edited, time-consuming content that gets no views. Will you be putting the pilot episode up on your YouTube channel just to let people know that, hey, this is the content I'm now doing and this is where you can find future episodes? Uh, so that it can get stolen by a channel where I then have to fight it over copyright and well, they're going to claim that it's theirs and I'm going to have to go battle that? No. I'm, I'm, this is YouTube. They No. They've made this impossible. All right. So I guess the, the trailer will have to be good enough for people to hopefully uh, follow you along there. I mean, if you, if you go to watch an episode of Airwolf... You have to pay for it um, in one form or another, whether it's on Netflix or Amazon. I actually forget. I, I'm, I'm taking days of time to produce these new shows. They're expensive. It's going to Amazon. Did you think about ever doing a Kickstarter for a season to finance a season so you would, wouldn't have to worry about no, the videos potentially? I, you know, when you've done crowdfunding like I've done it, you, you realize that it does work, but at the same time, it's exhausting. It's, okay. it's, it's so exhausting. I, I've run numerous successful Kickstarters and I, I've delivered everything and I'm still working on uh, my last one from last year, uh, which is, I just actually was filming yesterday, doing some editing on it this morning. It takes so much time to get all that stuff done. And then, you know, you're still running a show, you're still running a Patreon, you're still running publishing. I guess by you, I mean me. <laughs> I'm still doing all this other stuff. Uh, no, I mean, if it's, if the market isn't there on Amazon, the market isn't there on Amazon. I'm going to give it a year. I think it's going... I personally think we're going to be talking in 2028 about uh, the next reboot. 2028? You're going to have the, the, the 2185 reboot? Is <laughs> well, it's like you said, you got to look at what the market is. On YouTube, your market is 
getting younger and they want different kinds of content. Um, are you going to see you in a, in a Spider-Man outfit with Elsa? Is that what we're going to see classic game room become <laughs> a Spider-Man costume with Elsa? It, that, that doesn't sound so bad. Wait, what, what we, wait, we're, hold on now. What? Oh, that's the videos that were very popular where you'd have Spider-Man marrying Elsa. Um, you know, th- these were the videos that went, we got ultra popular with kids. They were garbage videos, <laughs> but kids, but kids watched them. And then finally they were like, no, we're not, YouTube's not, we're not allowing the characters that are Disney owned to be, you know, f- farting around and pretending to be pregnant and throwing poop at each other. That's what these videos were. There were, there were adults play acting as these characters and they would get like 10 million views each because like yeah. four year olds are watching them. Yeah, yeah. And kids watch stuff on repeat and kids just all, they just go click, 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 click through like a million videos. Yeah. yeah the, but that's. Kids are, Kids really have changed uh, YouTube. It's, there's been so much change over 10 years. But, Damn yeah. you, these whippersnappers changing our YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm not but entirely yeah. sure what the future is going to bring, Pat, but time has come to hit the reset button, and uh, I think it's going to be an awesome show. I hope that people can give it a chance. Check it out. I think for longtime viewers of Classic Game Room, it's probably what you've been hoping the show could do for years, but... Damn, is it time consuming? Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, people keep claiming for video game years to come back, and that was a show that took a ton of time, but also t- cost a ton of money, and so it's tough to do that. So if that comes back, there's no way it can happen without a Kickstarter. It just it just wouldn't be feasible. Yeah, uh, that, well, that makes sense uh, if you're doing something like that because you had a lot of people involved. More people means yeah. more money. Uh, multiple more editors affects yeah. people. Uh, if it comes back, the producers would be great. If the producers got paid, uh, meaning me, that'd be awesome. Um, and then uh, the on-air talent would be cool to pay them. And, you know, it's just a, so it actually give people an, an incentive to actually produce it, not just volunteer time, which could be a good product, but it could not be. So I'm proud of Video Game Years. Um, Everybody um, watch that, by the way. It's very good. It's on Amazon Prime, Video Game Years. It is on Amazon. The VideoGameYears.com. And but that's not a YouTube show. It absolutely is not. There's nothing else like that that's been produced before or since to you know, with that many people involved, with that consistency of quality, I would argue. And your content is always linked next to mine on Amazon. It's like we're Amazon buddies. Oh, okay. Well I guess your success is, is partially video game your success. <laughs> Pat, I give you a high five. You give me a high five. Can I get your ass out to a convention finally to see you in person? Is that possible or is that still not a possibility at this point? I still don't have plans to travel to conventions at the moment. I mean, it's just time consuming. It's expensive. I can't get you to I can't get you to too many games in Pennsylvania. I think can't that always falls on a weekend when I'm doing something. I know I I believe I had to turn that down for the last three years in a row because I'm always busy that weekend. Oh man, Mark, you're killing me, buddy. You gotta, yeah, I'm not you gotta, a convention guy. Everybody thinks like, oh, do you want to go to shows and have fun? I'm like, you know, I kind of like to get out and have fun. Don't get me wrong, but like it's not – I don't like to travel all that much. And then I end up getting just sucked in. I'm like a workaholic. I, I just actually love to work. <laughs> all right. Why. So where can pe- people can find you on Twitter? Classic Game Room on Twitter. Uh, the Instagram is actually just is getting huge right now. I just broke 10,000 on Instagram, so I'm really excited about that. You know what? I haven't done the Instagram. I, ha- I don't understand. I guess I should get on it at some point. And just uh, post stuff it, from the game collection or Instagram or videos works or- really well for me. I think it's one of the more relaxed, friendlier social media platforms. I mean, I could tear into social media for like another hour if you want me to. I hate social media, but no, no Snapchat, no classic game from Snapchat. <laughs> I don't uh, see. I don't understand Snapchat at all. <laughs> no, yeah, that's what, that's how we know we're too old. We're, when we we're like, okay, that's way too young for us. All right, well, Mark, thanks for coming on again. I'll talk to you. Maybe less than a year. We'll see how your show's doing. Maybe in the summer or fall. And that's uh, Classic Game Room 2085. Classic Game Room 2085. And Pat, we'll talk again in, in uh, 2028. 2028. I might be out of the game myself. I might be retired somewhere. We, we, uh, will, uh, we, will, we will talk before <laughs> 2028. Uh, thank you once again to everybody so much for, for watching the shows. Uh, it's been 10 years that I've just thoroughly enjoyed i love i just love producing the shows and it will continue it will continue mark, just in a different form mark i wish you the best of luck i i think you're going to find success in some form or another you're a hard worker with your books putting out a thousand books uh don't 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 just don't just don't don't, don't name a book ultimate we'll be okay we'll be friends all right <laughs> it's the mark. ultimate 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 nes guide an intent collector's guide to the nes library the ultimate 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 book. It written well, maybe by send that, Pat maybe send Country, that Pat spelled with two T's and R E Y for the end. You'll, you'll get like my doppelganger 
put the put the picture on the inside flap. Uh, doing uh, Pat, thank you, thank you for having me on the podcast once again, and uh, it's been fun. Take care. I want to thank Mark again for coming on the Not So Common podcast with me, and thanks to sponsor Dollar Shave Club. Go to dollarshaveclub.com slash pat where you can get the executive razor, a six blade razor with four cartridges for only a dollar with free shipping, no commitment, and you can cancel anytime. It's a fine razor. Again, dollarshaveclub.com slash pat. One buck, free shipping, no commitment, cancel anytime. And that's it for this edition of the Not So Common Podcast. You know, if you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the word. Give it a like, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast platform of choice, Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you use, or whatever you use to listen to podcasts. Uh, follow me on social media at Pat the NES Punk. And I also have a Patreon if you want to help support this content and my endeavors. It's patreon.com slash Pat Thanks, and I'll see you next time.